Uh, so my name's Una May O'Reilly. Uh, I'm a PI here at CSAIL, and I had the privilege to uh, work on the organizing committee uh, for this event. Um, and one of the perks is I get to chair one of the sessions. And so I'm going to start this last session um, by introducing our first speaker, who's very dear to us here at CSAIL. Um, it's Dr. Tom Layton, and he wears two hats. Um, he's a professor of mathematics here at uh, MIT, and he also founded Akamai Technologies. Um, and he's moved on from being chief scientist to now being its CEO. Um, and in both those capacities, he's been just an integral member of CSAIL. Um, he has many awards um, and many accomplishments. Uh, when I go cherry picking them, I, I, I love the fact that uh, there was a picture of him earlier at a science fair when he was young. Um, but uh, I know also that he's in the American Academy of Science, so we should recognize that. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to him so he can have the time to talk to you. Hey, thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to be back with so many friends and, and colleagues. It's, uh, it's been a while, obviously. CSAIL has an incredibly rich history, as, as you all know, especially after today. Uh, and really is a special place, and I think very worthy of, of celebrating. I'm going to give just one story about CSAIL being a special place, and that you know, talks about the beginnings of Akamai, uh, which was born here uh, in CISO a long time ago, uh, actually now over 25 years ago, uh, and across the street back when it was, or the precursor of part of CSAIL, the Lab for Computer Science. Uh, that's a picture of me, believe it or not, uh, probably over 25 years ago with Danny Lewin, who came to MIT in 95 as a graduate student, or 96 as a graduate student from the Technion. And of course, uh, I was in the, the theory group, uh, managed the algorithms group, which was a small subset of the theory group, and uh, a mathematician. So what we did is prove theorems about computational kinds of things like routing packets and big networks, and then we published papers uh, about the theorems. And uh, meanwhile, down the hall, literally, uh, was Tim Berners-Lee and the Web Consortium. You know, Mike managed to get, uh, Mike Dertuzos managed to get Tim to come here. And Tim, obviously a very prescient fellow, uh, invented the web as, as we know it. And he was worried with his team about a problem, which was the World Wide Web was at risk of becoming the World Wide Wait. And in fact, in the late 90s, there were a lot of famous examples where you, know, you host some popular content on a website, everybody goes there to get the content, the website gets crushed, the internet goes down, at least around the website, and nobody gets the content. Uh, you know, serious challenge back in the day. Now, one of the beautiful things about CSAIL and its precursors is interdisciplinary research. You know, it was the lab for computer science, and they actually let mathematicians in the building. Uh, not only that, they would speak to us. Uh, and it's, you know, that's a pretty rare thing. But it's a very valuable thing to get people from different disciplines together, because good things happen. And in our case, you know, Tim and, and his team were worried about, well, how do you distribute content when this thing really scales up and some of it's popular? And you know, the folks I worked with, you know, we were working on the same kinds of ideas, not so much the web, but in abstract big networks, you know, and designing algorithms and ways of you know, where would you store what where, how would you replicate things, how do you avoid congestion in networks as the packets are running around. And so we developed a lot of cool technology back then. And one of the gems you know, was uh, an idea Danny had about consistent hashing. You know, everybody knows about hashing. It's uh, an easy way to decide what to store where so that you can find it quickly and you do it in a load balanced way. And of course, one of the problems back then is the algorithms are very static. All the algorithms you learn in computer science classes back then. Like what if a server fails or you're really in a distributed system with imperfect knowledge? Then what do you do? And Danny came up, you know, with the ideas for a, a very elegant approach that was so good it had to be impossible. It couldn't work. Um, but it did. In fact, today it's widely used in all sorts of systems you use every day, including uh, Akamai to this day. So um, all right, 
What do we do? Well, we're theoreticians. We write papers. So we wrote you know, papers. And uh, you know, the, the, one, the first paper was really good, had consistent hashing and a bunch of other stuff for how would you really distribute content in a large scale network. And so we thought, wow, this, this could actually be practical. It's, we thought it was good theory, but maybe it's useful. So we sent it to the Symposium on Discrete Algorithms. And that was a theory conference where the papers you know, had a practical aspect. And classically, it was rejected. All right, and this was the foundation paper, really. And the worst of it is they said, we're rejecting it because there's no hope of this being practical. You know, and literally, you all use it in system, multiple systems every day and, and don't know it. Um, anyway, uh, so that was discouraging. And it probably all would have ended there, but for a series of fortunate, strange events, starting with Danny getting into a crisis because he was about to literally go broke. He had massive student loans. Uh, his wife didn't work. He had two kids in private school. And he's a theoretician, which means he's never going to make any money, at least back then. All right, you know, the only worse job in terms of pay scale than a theoretical computer science then was a mathematician. And Danny was borderline you know, between the two. Uh, anyway, he lived next door to a guy named Pritish Nijewan, who was in the Sloan School in graduate student housing. And Pritish you know, was feeling sorry for Danny. Um, and they were having some beer. And Pritish said, I've got a solution. You're doing some pretty cool research. You should write it up in a business plan competition and enter the 50K contest. And somehow, after enough beer, they got confused that if Danny won, then he'd get $50,000. And that was about what he owed the banks for his student loans. Now, that's not how it works. But you know, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, Danny's a convincing fellow, so I was adv his advisor. He convinced me, let's enter the 50K. Well, the only problem was none of us had ever written a business plan, even Pritish, who was in the Sloan School. And we didn't have a clue. We are mathematicians. So literally, we got books, that book and a bunch of others from the library, you know, business plans for dummy. And, and dummies, and we, we wrote a three-page business plan to enter the first preliminary round of the 50K. And somehow, we didn't know there was a 1K, but we won the software category. Pritish comes back and says, guys, this is big. We've won the software category. And it's the 1K. We said, do we get 1,000 bucks? No. There's 10 categories. We won software. So we got 100 bucks. <laughs> not, not enough to pay off Danny's loans, uh, but it was enough for some more beer. Anyway, Pritish is he's jazzed. He goes, guys, this is big. Danny and I don't have a clue. Uh, but he says, now we got to enter the main competition. So we wrote a 30-page business plan. And we sort of, how we measured the quality of our plan was how many pages, you know how that goes. And uh, one thing led to another. And somehow, we made the final six out of 150 teams. And Pritis is ecstatic now. He goes, guys, real companies come out of this. You know, and you're in the final six. And uh, so the team grew. You know, as other teams get eliminated, they find teams that are still in the game. And we were still in the game. And before we knew it, we had a couple dozen people that had joined our team. You know, we thought, wow, we've hit the big time when some businessman from California flew all the way from the West Coast to join our team. Uh, a graduate student at Harvard Business School came all the way down Mass Ave to join our team. <laughs> you know, and we thought, well, OK, this is getting larger now. In fact, we had at least two dozen people in my office every day. I still, still feel bad for Shafi Goldwasser who was sharing this office suite with me. And literally, she had to crawl over bodies to get into her office, because we're, we're working on this 50K. Now, urban legend has it we won. Not true. We lost. Uh, they announced the first, second, and third winners. We were not a announced. In fact, I'm sure we were dead last, because we really had no clue. That businessman from California, we discovered later, had no clue. Uh, and we, we just didn't measure up to the other teams. In fact, you know, one of the toughest things is that it was a co-winner situation. One of them was a nonprofit beat us in a business plan competition. <laughs> now, <laughs> that was sort of, you know, a slap, you know. Anyway, uh, so afterwards, though, we met 
a lot of people who had a lot of experience during the 50K. Uh, industry experts, venture capitalists. We lo I learned what a venture capitalist did. And uh, we got a, a lot of advice. And after the 50K, they approached us saying, you know, we sort of like your technology. And we'd like to start a company uh, with it. And <laughs> we said no, uh, because we weren't sure we had the right business plan. All we had was algorithms, papers, theorems, no code at all. Um, we lost the, we didn't win the 50K. Uh, you know, I liked being a professor. Danny wanted to be a professor. And so we said no. And actually, that businessman from California took our plan, went out and started a company we found later, uh, and became a competitor until they went broke a year later. Anyway, we decided we weren't going to form a company. And we, we wanted to give away our technology. We tried convincing carriers at the time to use it, but they weren't interested. They said, everybody knows distributed computing is an ivory tower concept. Thank you very much. Please go back to your ivory tower, which we did. And it would have ended there, except for Hacker Haven. And this was an idea that Mike Dutuzos had, where he would give you the money to hire all the undergrads you want for coding to hack over the summer. And being a theoretician, we never had money. So all of a sudden, there was money. So I hired, I think, 15 undergrads, mostly sophomores, to code up a system based on our algorithms. Now, during the 50K, we, we tried to talk to pretend future customers. One of them was Paramount Digital Entertainment. And they owned the online rights for the old Star Trek TV show. And they said, if you actually build this thing, and you actually can deliver our content for us cheaply and efficiently, we will use you to distribute the Star, War, sorry, the Star Trek TV show, the original series, online. You can do it. And even better, they sent me two giant boxes of Star Trek paraphernalia. This is the original tie, little faded from 25 years, about 25 years ago today we got it. And the Tribble still works 25 years later. I, I don't know how. Uh, anyway, you know, we, we passed this out to the MIT undergrads. They went nuts. They coded round the clock for the whole summer. And at the end of the summer, we had not one working prototype, but two based on different variations to see which worked better. In LCS, we had our clusters of servers spread throughout the building. You know, in one cluster was Paris, another was Rome. We could unplug them and see failover. Great stuff. It's amazing what MIT undergrads can do. Uh, so at the end of the summer, things were a little different. It wasn't just theorems. We had working prototypes, a real system. And of course, over time, I've learned to appreciate that theory is not the same as a working system. Uh, but now we had a prototype. And so we actually, one thing led to another and decided to create the company, go out there, build the system, and sell it as a service. And uh, finally, we got out of Shafi's hair, moved out of my office across the street to incubator space, had to use money to buy servers. We hired employees. A lot of, they were all MIT students. Uh, our first uh, live content was a single pixel buried deep in Disney site, where nobody would go except us. But we delivered that pixel really well. Uh, and it worked. Our big break came with the release of a Star Wars trailer. Now, way back then, before the Star Wars movie would come out, the trailer for the movie would be released. And it was a big deal. And in this one, Steve Jobs had bought the exclusive rights to distribute the trailer. And he did that because he wanted everybody using QuickTime. And this was a way to try to help make that happen. We didn't know any of that. We had talked to a Entertainment Tonight, and they, you know, trying to get them to use our, our new service. And they said, well, wait a minute. You know, we're going to have the Star Wars trailer. It's going to be available on this certain Tuesday night at 9 PM. Would you distribute it for us? We said, yes, great. And so Tuesday night at 9 o'clock comes. We get the trailer. We distribute it. Things are working great. The whole company is there. Then we see these news reports. Apple.com is down. The whole site's down. All the other bootleg sites are down, except for one, Entertainment Tonight. 
So we discovered we had a bootleg copy of the Star Wars trailer. We weren't supposed to have it. It was supposed to be exclusively on Apple. In any case, somebody at CNN who was techie figured out why is Entertainment Tonight working? And he found it back to us, wrote a great story about us, and we became known. Then, you know, that was March. On April 1st, literally April 1st, some guy purporting to be Steve Jobs calls up our president, Paul Sagan at the time, says, I want to buy your company. It's April Fool's Day. We were all practical jokers. Uh, you know, so what does Paul do? Ha ha, click. <laughs> and then Paul comes out and goes, all right, which one of you bozos just called me pretending to be Steve Jobs? So Danny and I look at each other. Paul goes, oh, crap. <laughs> anyway, it was Steve Jobs. He was trying to buy the company because we were the only ones that could deliver the trailer. All of Apple was, was down. Anyway, we just didn't want to sell, but we came very close to Apple. They became our first strategic investor. Oddly enough, I'm told that their investment at Akamai when we did our IPO was worth more than the rest of Apple. Unbelievable times. Um, we did IPO later that year. It was nuts. As much as you know, there's been a bubble recently, it was 10 times bigger back then. You know, We had almost no revenue. We're losing a fortune. We had a good story. And we became worth, I think, $35 billion as a company overnight. Literally nuts. Uh, now, one of our problems was we were very liberal with the stock. So all the undergrads involved in the Hacker Haven project for us and that most came to the company, we gave them a lot of stock. They became worth zillionaires, literally. They're 19 years old, 20 years old. And so we did have a challenge. OK, you know, how do you manage through that? One of the things we're proud of is that all of them did go back and finish their degrees. We said, you can work for us for a year, and then after that, a day a week, but you got to finish your degree and you can keep vesting, uh, which they did. Now, about the time we figured out how to solve the student zillionaire problem, we had the student bankruptcy problem. Because as fast as it went up to 35 billion, it went down to 50 million. Total crash. You know, to this day, we're the only public company to survive a crash of that magnitude, 700 to 1. Unbelievable. Um, massive downsizing had to lay off the majority of the company. The worst of all, a terrible tragedy on 9-11. Danny was the first person killed on 9-11. You know, he was an expert in counterterrorism, fluent in Arabic, was captain in the Israeli Special Forces. He was on American Flight 11. He tried to stop the hijacking and was killed in the process. Just devastating uh, loss. And the square near here is named in his honor. All our customers are going broke. It's carnage out there at that time when the bubble burst. Literally, these are the headlines. We're dead. The only ones that don't know it is us. You know, we're down to two or three months of cash you know, to live. Um, and you know, we're having literally the conversations with the remaining employees. That light at the end of the tunnel looks like a freight train. It's not, uh, you know, <laughs> we think. Uh, but basically, you know, this is where the, the MIT culture, the CCL culture, the people, you know, it make all the difference. Because it's a really challenging time, just unbelievably hard. But come together, solve it as a team, you know, be cognizant of the issues you're facing. And uh, we got through it, amazingly enough. Uh, you know, and today, uh, we're the world's, not the largest cloud platform, obviously, but the most distributed. We are the largest at content delivery, the largest at things like security as a cloud service, web app firewall as a service, and industry we created. Oddly enough, today, security is our largest product line, just crossed delivery, uh, making a lot of investments there to, to keep you all safe. And next for us is cloud computing. And what we want to do uh, is do for compute the same as we've done for delivery and security, so that your containers can spin up automatically based on user demand anywhere in the world in hundreds and hundreds of locations. Something that's not possible today, but I hope within the next year we will demonstrate that, which is, I think, pretty exciting. Uh, we deliver a lot of traffic. You use us every day. We do 7 trillion DNS resolutions every day, pretty much not all of them, especially not in China, but most everywhere else. So you're using us every day. Uh, and our mission is the same, to power and protect life online. 
And our purpose in doing that is to make life better for billions of people, billions of times a day. And I think I'm, I'm over time. So thank you.